Is on? How's it going, everybody? I will guarantee you one thing about this speech that I will be the smallest speaker to ever be at Sarnax. I do not lift weights, I swing a hammer. That's all I do. Um, my name is Neil Kamimura. I'm third generation born Hawaii. My great grandfather was an immigrant from Japan. My bloodline, Kamimura, is blacksmiths. They made samurai swords, they made weapons. He came as a child on a boat to Hawaii and they moved him to Olaa Sugarcane Company where he became a blacksmith at a young age. He was a phenom. He was the only person that the other sugar canes and on the other islands of Hawaii that they would boat his cane knives over to, which was unheard of because they all have their own blacksmith camps. His name was Teiji Kamimura. His son was a barber. That was my grandfather. My, my father was a developer and contractor. When I was born in 1981, they named me Teiji Kamimura. I was named after the bladesmith. His sign was later then put in the Japanese American History Museum as being the first Japanese person to so own his business in the state of Hawaii in 1932. So when you have one of my shirts, it's established 1932 Hawaii where his phone, his phone number was four digits long. On the other side of my family, my family fought with the 44th second. I've been Japanese American and proud of it my entire life. And, our, and me as people, as being Japanese American, we had no problems showing our worth to this great country, America. So, going on to that. You know, I was raised in a small town called Waimea on the Big Island. And I was a mama's boy. Everybody else was playing outside and I was inside cooking with my mom. I loved my mom. She would uh, read me books and she would say, let's go travel. That was the way we traveled. And so I'd lay in bed, look up at her and she would read these books to me about all these different places. And uh, I just had the perfect life. And then when I was nine years old, her mom died and she had left her family because of whatever reasons and came into my family. All these memories flooded back to her. Now all of a sudden she remembers her dad putting a knife to her neck and telling her mom to strip tease and dance in front of her or he'll cut her neck. Then he later on moved to hanging himself in front of her. And when her mom died, all these memories came back to her and broke her. And I was nine years old and I went from having the best mom to a mom that was stabbing me, beating me, clawing my eyes out. And what do you do at that age, right? Then as I was 14 years old, well, when I was 14 years old, I dropped out of school. My mom was on suicide watch. I lived in a home where we had to take knives and lock them into a lockbox and had to unlock it to cook. So I wasn't able to stay at school because I had to stay and watch my mom, deal with my mom and learn how to, you know. And at that time, the deeper she goes and the deeper she gets depressed, when you're a kid, you take it as eh, that's your fault, right? You're like, I'm at home with her and every day she is getting worse. Then I was 14 years old, I met this girl named Christy. And she was the most level-headed person. She's right here. That's my kid's mom. And uh, she took me into her family and she changed my life. But at the time, I didn't have the tools to be in a relationship. I got married at 18. I did love her, but I had lived in a situation where I drove my mom, I would come home I'd go to a party and my mom was like, don't you go to that party, I'm having a bad time, you know? And I want, I'm a kid, I wanna go to the fucking party. So I go and I come back and I find her naked, cut with a wrist, here to here, and I gotta taper, and I gotta put a pillow behind my back, and I gotta go drive to the hospital, and I take it on me. And so what that teaches you at a young age is that that was your fault, right? That's love, right? And so when I was in a relationship with my newfound wife, I didn't have the tools to be in a relationship. And the worst 
it went and the worse it got, I had literally at 19 years old took a rope because I felt like our relationship wasn't going the way it wanted and I hung myself in front of her because that's all I know. And I, I took these, we're kids, we're 19. Can you imagine being married at 18 years old? Like we went through puberty together, you know, like it, it, it's a crazy experience. And uh, I just didn't have the tools and what I did was I, I only knew the relationship I had with my mom, so I guilted her. I was addicted to this thing called guilted love. And so I basically just went on and anytime something didn't go my way, I would guilt her. And it's just something that she couldn't understand coming from a situation where her family was normal and mine was fucked up. So basically, you know, and everything that I'm telling you today, I'm not, I don't make rules. I don't make guidelines. I'm not telling you the secrets to life. If it touches your heart, use it. You know, that's all I'm trying to share with you today. I'm just going to tell you my story. I'm not going to answer questions and I'm going to make a knife. So let me get this thing lit. So as we were married, our marriage was rough. We had already been married for, I was 26 year, years old. We had been married and uh, it wasn't going well. Anytime any situation came up, I, would, I was still taking care of my mom at the time, financially and physically and mentally. So anytime she would need something from me, I would tell her, no man, like look at what I'm dealing with. Look at me. And, in, and in, to be 100% honest with you, I was relieved. Like, you know, because I didn't have to be a good husband. I didn't have to be a good person because I have all these excuses. I have all this shit that's happening to me, you know? By the way, today we're gonna forge a little chef knife out of this, in between of all of this. Um, but right when we were about to get divorced, wouldn't you know she got pregnant <laughs> and we're both career people I had never anticipated having a child when she found out that she was pregnant she laid in the shower and cried for about two hours I broke out in hives on both sides of my body I continued in the same scenario I wasn't a good father I'm a man I work I make all the money I come home I eat dinner I argue with my wife, my kid watches TV. That's the kind of father I was. And uh, everything just became into this boiling point for me. You know, and, and it wasn't a good scenario for me, but it's all that I knew. And I know some of you may have felt like that. It got to a point 15 years into our marriage that she just didn't want to be with me anymore. And uh, she told me, you are a miserable fucking person. You're the most miserable person and no one will ever love you. You cannot bring happiness to anyone's life. And she said that out of anger, you know? And I brought a lot of reasons, man. I had a lot of issues, I had a lot of problems. I don't have a problem with drugs or alcohol, but I sure had a problem with women. And that's just the honest truth. I love their attention because of whether, whether it was like I have mom issues, I don't know, right? <laughs> so she came to me and she told me one night, she says, listen, I met somebody new. I know you are already talking to some other girl that thinks you're so fucking cool. She's like, I want it to be done. And you got to remember, this is someone who saved my life. So whether I was a good husband or not, I loved her. This is somebody I lost my virginity to under a fucking tree on a mountain at 14 years old. And when she told me she didn't love me, it broke my heart. And the only thing that I knew to do was to take my 357 Magnum 586 six inch barrel Pulled it out in front of her, looked her dead in the fucking eyes, opened the, 
opened it, dropped one single bullet, spun it and shut it. And I said, you want to leave me? And I put it in my mouth and I pulled the fucking trigger. Fortunately, it didn't go off. But she pissed her pants. I made the woman that I love my whole life piss her pants. I broke her. I took a piece out of her that she can never go back. And at that point, I knew 100% that I was not a good father and I was not a good husband and I wasn't good for anybody. And so I left. And unfortunately for me, even though she didn't want to be with, anymore, with me anymore, she still believed in me as a parent. So when I wanted to run away and do nothing with my life, she dropped my kid off and didn't answer my phone calls for two weeks. And I was like, shit, you know, I got this little kid looking at me and he's Japanese, Okinawan, Irish, Dutch, German. And he's the sweetest kid and I'm blessed that you will ever meet. And he just looked at me and I'm like, who packs your lunch? And he's like, mom. I'm like, who takes you to school? He's like, mom. I'm like, shit, I have to do all these things. I have to be an adult, you know? So I had to go to the store, buy peanut butter, buy jelly, cut the crust off. I'm like, why don't you eat the crust? And he's like, so where my mom makes it, you know? <laughs> and so that was a turning point. His name is Maddox Ryan Kamimura. And that for me was an absolute new beginning. It was something, when you have this little face looking at you, and you gotta remember, like, I'm living, I built lowriders before this. And so, I'm in my shop, and I'm just miserable, like, dealing with all my demons. I, I don't even know how to wash clothes. You know, I gotta YouTube that shit, you know? And I'm, like, trying to figure out all this stuff, and, and I'm miserable as fuck, dealing with my demons, right? And she... You know, she just leaves him with me. And so he's like, hey, can we go buy a TV? I'm like, yeah, all right, let's go buy a TV. He's like, and so we go buy a TV. And then he's like, ah, oh, shit. Can somebody grab me a glove? Sorry for the noise, people. So this little kid is looking at me. Then he tells me, can I ride my bike in the house? I said, yeah, it's a shop, you know? And we had a twin bed. We slept together touching. And that little kid saved my life, hands down. So then I realized this relationship that I had with my mother was toxic. And uh, it was a big part of the re reason why, you know, and I, and I take some of the blame myself. My marriage was ended because of me. But having that kind of situation that I have to take care of someone like that really messed me up. And so, basically, basically I had to make boundaries for her. And I told her, listen, I'm dying. And all I can do right now is be a good father. That's absolutely all I can do. And that's what I'm gonna do. You're an adult, take care of yourself. I had to set more boundaries with her. But then when her husband died, she, uh, she got really close to my son. And uh, 
But then she got addicted to drugs again. And then she started wrecking my cars that I had bought for her. And she had started doing really dumb stuff. And so I told her, listen, like I got to reel back on the money. And you can't be driving my cars. You got to buy your own cars. You got to do these things. And what happened is she used my kid as leverage. So she picks up my kid from school one day and just don't answer her phone. So now my kid's missing, you know. Then she tries to do it again and the cops show up, you know, and it was just a mess. And I told her, you have to have controlled visits. So you have to have controlled visits. So this is what she does. She tells me she's going to kill herself because that's all she knows. And you know what? Personally, I couldn't deal with it at the time. Personally, I couldn't deal with it at the time. And so what happens is she starts creating drama. She starts showing up at my ex-wife's house, she starts doing crazy shit. She got a hold of my kid and took my kid to a shrink. And then I almost beat the shit out of the shrink. And it just wasn't healthy for me. So th those, the, this is three years ago. She sends me a text. sends me a text, say goodbye to Maddox. I'm going away because you took the last thing that was good in my life. And I hope you have to live with it. And for me, I just was like, this is Wednesday. She always does this shit. And I was getting, so three days later, I was getting this tattoo on my neck. That's my mom's, uh, family crest is chrysanthemum and I get a phone call from my dad and he says your mom's dead she killed herself and in a way I already knew what it was about so I finished the tattoo drove up to the hospital met my older brother and uh, got to see her body my mom was 62 years old and she had a decomposed face because she died on it. She died from cocaine and oxy uh, overdose. And that was a memory. I'm a pretty tough motherfucker. I may be small, but I'm tough. And seeing that broke me. It broke every inch of me. I could not get it out of my head. I go up to her house, which got looted because they wheeled their way in an ambulance. And there, where she died, she died on a bench that fell into the one side of the couch where she bled into the couch. And uh, there was some cocaine, there's some shit. And she wrote me this long letter. I got about four sentences into that letter and that letter was blaming me telling me, now you fucking live with it. You deal with it. You try it on, you know? You did this to me. What do you do, right? I punch shit, I beat shit up. I build low rider, so I try to work on my low rider. I smash the whole fucking fender in. Hold on, I forgot I'm forging a knife.
So then, I have a new beginning. One of my mentors that taught me how to build and build and weld and do custom suspensions, juice cars, bag them, build frames, tells me, you love that TV show, Forge and Fire. Your great grandfather was a bladesmith. Why don't you give it a try? And he's a, he has a rubbish company and he uh, found an old forge in the trash and a half of an anvil that somebody cut in half. And he gave it to me the week my mom died. And I had a little shed. I put it in there. I was scared to light it because I thought it was going to blow up. But I just did it. Forged a, uh, forged a leaf spring knife out of my 1949 Cadillac suspension. And I made a knife. And the moment that I hit that, like what you're seeing right now, the moment that I took it out like this, this is all I saw. I didn't see my mom's dead face anymore. And so this is the only thing that saved me. And so what happens, is I make 70 knives in six months with an angle grinder, half an anvil, and a forge. The girl that I was seeing at the time, she signed me up for Forge and Fire. And we laughed about it, we had a good laugh. We were like, you know, it's funny. But every day I would come home, she would be like, man, that's super cool. And so it motivated me. You know, I'd make something, finish it up, bring it home, and she'd be like, that's amazing. You should go on Forge and Fire. And I was like, man, I've been making knives for six months. And one thing I knew about going on Forge and Fire is I didn't give a shit if I won. That's not what's important. Winning is never important. I wanted everybody to see that I'm from Hawaii. We are born and bred to compete. If you don't catch that set on the biggest wave, you won't live in Hawaii. If you don't jump off that 60 foot cliff with all your friends do, you won't live in Hawaii. If somebody steps up to you and can be as big as Brandon, you better fucking fight and get knocked out because you can't make it in Hawaii. And so that's what I knew about that show. And I went there with eight months experience and I won it. I won that show. <laughs> All right, so then, Forge and Fire, and I don't know if many of you know this, but we have one of the Forge and Fire Mastersmiths here. I was recently, I was recently, this is his signature weapon, the Kukri, and uh, I got a lesson from him. I'm filming for Recoil. I said, I'll help you bring the cool back into it, and so we shot an episode of how we make these and we took military axle and we forged a tomahawk with a door breacher on the back and but yeah we have a legend right here and I was honored to work with him um, so then four months later Forge and Fire says there's a champions of champions I said wow you know I've been making <laughs> making I haven't even made one year yet in making knives and I've never trained with anybody I'm all self-taught I don't know even if what I'm doing is right but they wanted me back, so they said, you want to go? And I said, yeah, I'll go. I don't really care. I know that I'll do my best. And then uh, they gave me the hardest challenge of my life. It was canister Damascus, which I had never even done Damascus, and I've never even touched powdered steel in my life. And, uh, you know, it was just one of those things. And I felt it mentally break me. It mentally broke me down. And I just, I had welded the first can, tore apart. Welded the second can, it tore apart. I took the, the two cans, I tried to weld them together, make something out of that, that failed. And one of the guys there looked at me and he laughed. And he's like, look like we all making it through. <laughs> you don't say that to somebody that has small man syndrome, I tell you that right now. <laughs> 
And so I welded a can at 40 minutes. And I did Canister Damascus in 32 minutes live on that TV show. And I threw their angle grinder into the wall. I screamed at everybody. I yelled, fuck you, to the top of my lungs. And I, I did it. It's not even scientifically possible, so they say. But I did it. And they edited a lot, a lot of what I was saying. <laughs> and I left there, and I came in second on that one. And I didn't care. That was perfectly fine for me. Because I went there breaking records. Nobody's forged a blade in 32 minutes, let alone done canister, hardened it, grinded it. I'm making a hidden tank chef knife, if some of you are wondering. But you know what? As I was doing that, and it was failing, this is what happened to me. I told myself, you deserve this. You took something that a traumatizing thing like your mom dying and you turned it into something now you're on TV look at you now you don't deserve this you deserve to fail and then I thought I have an adopted 25 year old son and I have my son Maddox and I told them as a parent how are you gonna look your kids in the eye and say take a chance follow your dreams Do what you want to do. Be fearless. If you are not, you are a bitch. You got to do it by example. And I told myself, I am not going home and telling my sons. I just couldn't do it. I failed. I failed as a person because I couldn't stand up to the challenge. And I quit. It's okay to lose, but it's not okay to quit. And what a lot of people don't know about that show and that time period, that week was the anniversary of my mom's death, the first year. And that night that I had made it past that round, I made it into the final stretch of the final two. I went home. I sat on that bed in Brooklyn and I just cried. I didn't know how I felt, you know? It was just one of those things. So as I get back from that, I'm in this relationship with this girl, Lauren. Free-spirited, yoga chick, Denver, Colorado. She showed me a lot of things. She believed in, you know, believed in me. She was probably one of my biggest fans, <laughs> you know, and uh, I just didn't know how to deal with it still. When times got hard, I always reverted back to that guilted love, you know, and she, we were kind of having some issues and she ran away back to stay at her mom's to clear her head. Things was going wrong. So I pulled out my 1911 and I'm yelling at her on the phone. I said, I'm gonna fucking blow my brains out. You're driving me crazy. Like, this is what you're doing to me. So I put a mag, I put a magazine in, rack it, set it on the bed and I looked at it and I'm talking to her on the phone. You know, she tells me, better you be single. <laughs> I was like, Wow, I thought she was gonna run back. I thought she was gonna be like, no, I can't. And she was like, no, man, fuck y'all. You better take care of your own shit. I'm over it. And she walked away from it. That's why I have this gun tattooed on me. Not because I'm a gangbanger, but because that 1911, that's what it represents to me. And I sat there by myself. Why did I do that? And I had to ask myself, Do I want to die? So this is what I tell myself. I tell myself, I'm third generation suicide. 
Grandfather did it. Mother did it. That's why. Second thing I tell myself, I want all the noise to go away because my head cannot take it. And then I realize that it's all bullshit. Do I really want to die? Fuck no, I don't want to die. I know how to actually kill myself. You know? Shotgun, take it off, you're done. No questions asked. I don't actually want to die. So I had to ask myself, what is it about me that does that? And that's where I came into the conclusion that and that's the two truths that we're going to talk about later. There's always an outer truth that seems good. So people come up to me and they tell me all the time, I won't make knives, but I got a full-time job. I got some kids. I should shit. You don't think I don't have that? You know, right? It's these things that we tell ourselves. Oh, that's the reason. No, the reason why is you don't want to get up like me 4 o'clock in the morning while my kid's sleeping to make knives. You don't want to stay late. When I don't have my kid, she has to call me home. It's all excuses. Just right? Like everybody here, you guys are all fitness people. You know that there's time in the day. There's, we work 40 hours. That is it. And there is countless hours in the week for us to accomplish what we want. So that was my outer truth and why I wanted to kill myself. But in reality, suicide gave me power. It gave me control over the person that I was around. Because what you put into their mind is fear. You hold them emotionally hostage to your situation. They have to imagine how they're going to live with the fact of you taking their life. And that's why I did it. Because I was a little bitch. And I wanted to be loved. And I wanted to be missed. And I wanted them to realize that they still wanted to be in my life. And the only way that I knew how was what I learned from my mom. So having to go through all of those experiences that I told you, and many of you have gone through those experiences. You know, small or big, it's all the same in our lives. What's happening immediately that's in front of us affects us in that way. So we talked a little bit about the two truths. But you have to remember today we live in a society that welcomes victim, victimizing yourself. So if you say, oh shit, man, I'm fat, I put on a couple pounds. Oh, it's okay, you big boned. <laughs> really? Are you big boned? I mean, I mean, I'm not going about weight or size, but that's the society that we live in. Or man, this guy broke up with me. She could be a raging psychopath, but their friend gonna tell him, oh no, it's him, right? We live in a society that's constantly just making excuses for each other to build each other up, but actually we're tearing each other down. That's what Instagram, that's what social media is all about. You know, we focus on just appeasing ourselves, that we're doing the right thing, that we're, we're, that it's okay, that we're not achieving our dreams, that we work a nine to five job like a zombie, and we have all this passion and creativity that we cannot go because it's okay, we gotta go get that job that, you know what I mean? It's all of these things. We live in this, this world. And so, then there's negativity. So you have that point where people are constantly victimizing each other and building each other up as victims. Then we have this thing, negativity. How many of you have gone to a beautiful party, a dinner at your friend's house, had a great time, and then you went home and you replayed in bed what you thought and what you said? You're like, shit, why did I say that? Man, that was stupid. I hope they didn't get offended. Why did I say that? Why did I do this? Why did I act that way? Have any, have any of you done that? Right? It's something that we do. Why? It's because we focus on negativity. 
there's two things that's popular on the internet, right? It's something they say is unbelievable and something that's super negative. I am forging a horrible knife because I am talking. <laughs> I guess I can't do two things at once. So why do we feel those pressures, right? Why do we feel like there's got to be goals? We got to be winning. We got to be number one. And if we're not, we're losers. Why do we feel that way? You know, and I think the number one problem that you can ever have in life for me, I'm not telling you what to do, but for me, if you strive for success, you strive for riches, you strive for love that's forced, and you look for happiness, because you think that house you're gonna buy or that PR that you're gonna break is gonna make you happy. It's not. For me, it's not at least. For me, it's about living in each individual moment. Because what happens when you get that house? What happens when you break that PR? You're the same person. You know, but if you had experienced that moment of something that you had achieved and you lived it and not videoed it on Instagram so you can't even see what somebody else is actually doing because you're holding the camera up like this and you're not experiencing it with your own eyes. That moment is lost and that achievement is done and you are empty. And I've experienced that many of times. I see a tremendous amount of strong people here. If there was a zombie apocalypse here, they'd be full because there's a lot of beef around this place. <laughs> I got like, I got, I'm the size of some people's legs here. And what happens to a strong person? I'm not talking about physically strong. I'm talking about mentally strong because men mental strength will always be 10 times more important than physical strength. You'll see somebody that ain't as strong as you break things that you can't do and it's because of his mental ability, it's his mental strength or he or she. And so we go through life, you know, thinking that sometimes physically strong or I got to get more money or I got to get that new job and that's what's going to make us happy. But the problem with being a strong individual and a strong mind is you go like this. You take this piece and you give it to your wife. You take this piece, you give it to your kids. You take this piece, you give it to the people you work with, the community you're in. And what happens when you do that? Because you're so strong, you can hold up everybody. But what happens when you do that is you're left with a hole. And for me, that hole is where the demons come in. That hole is where depression leaks in. That hole is what breaks me down. So, what I found that has worked for me is I fill that void with something that I'm passionate about. I will tell you this, if you follow your brain and your mind with your passion, you will always be driving home at five o'clock from work, day to day. If you follow your heart, and it, there's nothing wrong with driving home at five o'clock. I'm just talking about that. You're working a job that you don't want, you don't love, you know? When it comes to your passion, you need to follow your heart. When it comes to, you know, business decisions and different things, yes, obviously use your brain. 
But when it comes to your passion, you follow your heart. You make zero excuses. You protect it. You guard it. Because you know that's the only thing that you can take back and do for yourself and put it back. And that is your defense. The hardest thing to ever do in this life is not to get people to care about you. It's not to get people to love you. The hardest thing in life is to learn how to love yourself. I've always struggled with loving myself, you know? And loving yourself is the ability to look yourself in the mirror and see yourself whole. To talk to yourself in honest truth. And when you have a big hole in your chest because you're out there giving it when you don't have it, you cannot see yourself. You absolutely cannot see yourself. You can't see what you need. And when you can't see what you need and you can't love yourself, you are no good to anyone. Self-love is one of the greatest challenges that we come across, you know. For me, all my life I felt like I was no good. I was the cause of all the bad things. And what's funny is, when you don't love yourself, you sabotage yourself. And that's because, like me, maybe you were addicted to misery. You felt more comfortable in a situation that was in chaos rather than a situation that you deserve. And everybody here deserves great things to happen to them. And it, but loving yourself is just an extreme challenge. And that's why I tell you, and I tell, your kid, you, know, tell you that if you got kids, like, teach them something. Because when they can do something with their hands, they see self-worth. When you do, and I'm not saying just about making, it can be anything. But when you can do those things, and it gives them self-worth, It is priceless because when you love yourself you do not give yourself excuses you make things happen you take control of your life and what I mean by taking control of your life is every single one of us here are not characters in a book just because your parents killed themselves or they were alcoholics, or they weren't as good as you in certain ways, it doesn't make you that that's your fucking character. It is not. You are 100% the author of your book. You can write your pathway and your story every single day. It is a new chapter. It is a new page. It is not printed for you. You have a pen in your hand, and you can absolutely write your path. My path was destined for suicide and just fucking bullshit. 
and I turned it into being one of the most followed knife makers in the fucking world in three years. I've been making knives for three years because I knew inside I had only two options, die or be great. That's the only way that I live, 100% all the time. So if I'm going to give a speech, I'm going to work on it every single day for you people. I am not a speaker. I have a seventh grade education. I can barely write. Everything in that notebook is misspelled. So when we feel like we're on a good path, we're going well, we're doing good things, and we mess up, then it's like, boom, you just go all the way out. But it, in remembering that it is just a chapter, that it is just a page, it's just something to learn from, you know, you can own the world and when you do something you do it in a way that just punches everyone in the face when you walk out and you do anything in life whether it's digging ditches lifting weights giving speeches being a with the hardest job being a house housewife you know you do it 100% and you rip the face off of everybody, not to bring them down, because that doesn't bring them down. It actually inspires them. And that's what my Instagram is all about. My Instagram is about motivating, highlighting the American craftsmen. We have too many stupid human beings that are useless, that are popular on the internet. People ask me, how do you do what you do? And I said, if you look at all the knife makers, I'm probably one of the least talented. It's harder for me to do anything than everybody else. But personally, I don't care about talent. I think talent is a handicap. Determination is the fucking torque. Yeah. That's what gets things done. It ain't about the horsepower. It ain't about this. It ain't about that. I have more determination and that's what I focus on. I live life 100% uncomfortable. Oh, you're just a big island boy. You live on a fucking rock. You're going to stand in front of a bunch of huge weightlifters. Are you going to talk? I said, yep. Because I like being uncomfortable. If you're not uncomfortable, you're not going to do anything with your life. You're going to settle, 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 settle. If it isn't challenging you and making you feel like, ugh, I just welded 720 layers of Damascus and it might break, so what? I'll fucking do it tomorrow, right? And that for me has been some of the tools. God, this is the worst knife I've forged in a long time. <laughs> I mean, you get the drift, right? <laughs> so you ask yourself, and I had to ask myself, what am I doing here? Why am I speaking as a knife maker at this event? And the reason why is I feel like life is a lot like steel, a lot like metal, a lot like this knife. We're going to get beat up. Life's not going to go our way. You're not going to have the easy route. But nobody great, nobody great has come from the easy fucking life. Everybody has come from being a forged human being. 
And that's what this has in common. If you do not have the tools, and I'm not saying that what I'm saying is the tools. I'm saying if it touched your heart, whatever you have heard has touched your heart, those are your tools. And when you have the tools, this, this, then you can forge out something that is amazing for yourself. You can forge out something and turn this ugly thing that I forged This one? So this is my barbecue knife. Wow. This is my chef knife. This is 720 layers of Damascus steel. This is 160. So you can take something. This is all of us. We all started out as a chunk. And we're getting beat, 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 heated, stressed, inflamed, aggravated. Then you control it. You normalize it. You harden it. And then you focus it and you channel it. You hand rub that bitch into something that's a usable tool. And I noticed that a lot of you guys here and everyone here is a usable tool. And that's why you guys are here. So now with my life, I am not perfect. I'm a maniac, I'm a psychopath, and I, throughout all of this, I've been able to find not happiness, not any one particular thing, what I have found is contentment in my life, and that's the richest you will ever be. The richest you will ever be is to be content, and the ability to do what your heart wants to do every day. Fuck the money. If you can go do what you want to do every single day, you are the richest person. Because the richest person still has to work for people. I have been blessed in many things in my life. I have a beautiful son. I have a beautiful adopted son. That he's 25 years old and he wants to change his last name to Kamimura. Because he knows that I am building a legacy for them. That I will not leave them with our names meaning nothing. I was blessed with a beautiful wife. Stand up here, Flora. Someone who understands me and deals with my crazy ass. But as I've been talking to everyone here, and I'm looking at my wife and I'm thinking about my family. I realized that I haven't done something myself. When my mom died, the only thing that rang through my head was that she promised me as a child. She says, you know what? Don't ever let me die alone. And I looked her in the eyes as a little kid and I told her, man, I will never do that. I won't let you die alone. I'm here for you. And you know what I did? Nobody found her body for three days. And I realized after going through this, you know, it was for a reason. You know, I just, and you know, there's no better time than the present. I'm just going to say something to her, you know. Like, can you see me? Look at me! Look at what I'm doing for these people. I try to make something of my life. I beat it. I beat it for us. I stopped the chain and the reaction to suicide to suicide and I stopped it for my kids and I love you I forgive myself and I hope you forgive me and I love you my name is Neil Kamimura and this is me trying to live legendary Uh, 
Dziękuję.